All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 8, Growing Pains, The New Republic, 1790 to 1820. We'll be looking at Section 1, Competing Visions, Federalists and Democratic Republicans. So this chapter, The New Republic, this is in reference to the United States. Uh, we learned previously about how the 13 colonies came together, fought a war against Great Britain, and established a new nation, that is the United States. Um, and just to kind of briefly catch up to the 1790s, we had talked previously about the first government that was created in the United States, the first national government, I should say, and that was called the Articles of Confederation. And that government, in short, was too weak right too weak to function the nation had a lot of issues under the articles government uh one big one was the economic issue all there are a number of things that the articles government essentially couldn't do and that caused uh, many of the leaders of the nation to meet in philadelphia to create a new national government and what came out of that was simply the constitution Right, so the Constitution is the second and current government of the U.S. Of course, this consists of our three branches, the executive, the legislative, and judicial. And that went into effect in 1789. In 1789, George Washington stepped into office as the very first president. The very first Congress was voted into office in 1789, um, you know, the House of Representatives and the Senate, and not short afterwards, the creation of a judicial branch, which was lacking in the Articles government also came into effect. So this is, you know, this chapter in particular is looking at, you know, this sort of new national government, this new constitutional government from 1789, um, really up until the uh, present day. Uh, here, though, competing visions, as we'll see almost immediately after the Constitution was ratified and the three branches were put into effect, um, there were differences of opinions, particularly between two groups, Federalists and Democratic Republicans. You want to think of these two groups as the first two political parties in American history. And we sometimes call this, and this is a good term to be familiar with, uh, maybe we'll do it in blue, we call this the first party system. And a party system is simply any sort of um, political arrangement in the United States in which there are two political parties that are dominant. Uh, currently today, we are in a party system, depending on which historians that you, uh, you, know, that you refer to. Um, most would say we're probably in the third party system, although some say we're in like the fifth or the sixth. And that means just essentially wherever you live in the United States, there's only two parties to choose from. They're competitive all, all over. And this was very much the case uh, very early on, that there were pretty much only two choices, either the Federalists or the Democratic Republicans. And as you can you know, probably imagine here, they don't uh, fully agree. So initially, those who were in power were the Federalists. Now, recall that the Federalists were the ones who supported the new Constitution. Right, you know, they very much want a strong central government. And, um, you know, really the chief sort of Federalist, uh, so to speak, is Alexander Hamilton. We're going to call him not only Secretary of Treasury, because that's what he served as in Washington's administration. Washington, of course, is the first president of the United States. And as president, he uh, chose the first presidential cabinet. That's kind of like his inner circle. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was chosen as Secretary of Treasury. But we also want to identify Hamilton as really the leading federalist. You know, when it comes to 
those who advocate for the strongest central government. You know, Hamilton's really our, um, you know, our guy here. Um, so federalists supported the new national, or sorry, the new constitution want a strong central government. Thomas Jefferson, on the other hand, who was also appointed to Washington's administration, he was appointed as the, oops, as the secretary of state. He, in many ways, becomes the leading uh, Democratic Republican. And, uh, you know, these, this political party, the Democratic Republican Party, doesn't have any direct connection to the two current political parties, the Democrats and Republicans. However, it is a very confusing name because it includes both of those terms, Democrat and Republican. Now, recall during the debate during the Constitution, there was, you know, the, the debate was between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Now, it's true that many of the Federalists join the Federalist Party, right? Uh, and many of the Anti-Federalists join the Democratic-Republican Party, but the Anti-Federalists are not a political party. The Anti-Federalists were simply people who opposed the Constitution. So one good example is James Madison. James Madison was a Federalist during the constitutional debate. He supported the Constitution, but uh, afterwards he becomes a member of the Democratic-Republican Party. So again, the Anti-Federalists are not a political party. They were simply those people who opposed the Constitution. Uh, many of them did join the Democratic Republican Party, which is, you know, part of this first party system. So uh, Thomas Jefferson becomes really, in, in many ways, the leading Democratic Republican, and Hamilton and Jefferson really best represent um, these two competing visions for what the nation ought to be. Uh, also in Washington's administration, we're going to go ahead and add Henry Knox. He's the Secretary of War. All right, just maybe good to note these individuals here. And like I mentioned before, in 1789, the very first Congress, the first Senate, the first House of Representatives uh, was voted into session. Some important laws and first laws that they passed included the Ju Judiciary Act, which created the Supreme Court. Remember, there was no judicial branch under the Articles uh, system, so the Supreme Court was created. And a tariff act, which, you know, thinking in the immediate aftermath of the Constitutional Convention, the biggest issue was the economy. And now this Constitution allowed the national government to tax a tariff. We talked about this previously as a tax on imports. And this was designed to raise money for the war debt, right? The war debt. Another one of Congress's first actions was living up to that promise of passing a Bill of Rights. Recall during the constitutional debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, the primary concern of the Anti-Federalists in the Constitution was that there was no guarantee of protection of people's rights. Many Anti-Federalists said that if a Bill of Rights were to be included, then they would get on board and vote for the Constitution, vote yes for the Constitution. And so the first Congress, here we have anti-federalists, we'll just make a note, those who did not support the new Constitution, the new Constitution. And they demanded a Bill of Rights, and uh, the first Congress passed it, this became the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Uh, you have a list of the amendments in the, uh, in the textbook if you want to see the more detailed. Uh, you know, the First Amendment talks about freedom of religion, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. And, uh, you know, there's a couple more um, uh, amendments that are noteworthy that might pop up again in, uh, in American history. Um, so that was some of the first actions taken by Congress. Judiciary Act, Tariff Act to raise revenue and uh, passing a Bill of Rights. Now, like we mentioned before, the number one problem in the nation in 1789 is the bad economy. You know, this was largely a result of the war. This was a result of the war debt. This was a result of printing money and high inflation. This was a result of the United States being cut off from all trade 
by Great Britain during the war, so they couldn't do business and really failing to do business in the aftermath of that. So the economy is in a, a, a you know, it's, it's a big problem. And it was really one of the main reasons why a new constitution was created to begin with. And the person responsible for solving this economic issue is Alexander Hamilton, who you see pictured right here as the Secretary of State. Now, uh, there are a number of debt problems. Um, you know, states have debts. I might say state debt. Uh, there's, you know, sort of a national debt. Uh, there are money owed to, uh, you know, domestic People need money, you know, troops, veterans of the war haven't been paid yet. Uh, there are foreign nations that haven't been paid, ba uh, paid back yet. So a lot of debt to go around. A lot of people are owed money and a lot of people want that money pretty soon. So Hamilton creates a couple of reports to address the nation's economic issues. The first one is the report on public credit. And this mostly has to do with things like debt. And what Hamilton's plan is, or essentially what he favors, is the creditors. The creditors are the people, or we might say institutions, that loaned money, right? That loaned money. So Hamilton is concerned about the people who have loaned money. In his words, uh, the United States needs to do justice to creditors, particularly and specifically those foreign, you know, places like France, for example, maybe places like Great Britain, right? In this case, we would refer to these two as creditor nations because they lent the United States money. The United States would be a debt nation in this case. And the reason why Hamilton wants to focus on these foreign powers so much why he wants to pay back France first and pay back Great Britain first is to make the U.S. legitimate, right? Make it legit. And as long as the United States can pay back its foreign debt, pay it back to powerful countries like France and Great Britain, they'll recognize the United States as a legit nation. Whereas if the U.S. didn't pay back its foreign debt first, uh, those nations aren't going to look at the United States as a legitimate nation. Now, recall, you know, the United States, or sorry, the United States is in a very uh, early period in its history. It's very vulnerable. Uh, it's already gone through one change at the national government. You know, at this rate, the United States ought to change its constitution every 10 years or so. Um, so, you know, Hamilton wants to make sure that the United States isn't like a joke in the eyes of pretty much everywhere, everyone around the world. That's why the creditors are given priority. Uh, he also uh, allows for the U.S. government to sell bonds. This is a way to raise money. A bond is, uh, you know, an interest uh, accruing note. Uh, essentially, you purchase bonds from the government. You give the government money. They give you a note, and they say within 5, 10, 20 years, they'll give you, you know, whatever you paid plus 5%, 10%, whatever it is. This is an easy way for governments to raise money immediately. It's essentially a way for people to kind of like bet on their country. They're betting that in the future, their country will be better off and able to pay back that bond. So again, all these different ways of trying to raise money. However, this led to intense debate about, um, about the nation's finances. Um, one thing that Hamilton wanted to do was to combine all debts to make it easier to manage, uh, particularly among the states. And so, um, you know, by paying these things back ultimately led to various debates. First of all was the debate uh, via speculators. Uh, speculators were people or institutions, we're just going to say people to make it easy here, who bought debt for a discounted rate. So for example, you know, you're a Revolutionary War veteran. You know, this guy's going to be a Revolutionary War veteran. Uh, let's see what they were, triangle hats back in those days. That looks like a triangle hat. And, uh, you know, there's his, his gun. That doesn't really look like a good gun. Um, but, you know, you're a Revolutionary War veteran. You fought in the Revolutionary War, but you still haven't been paid back your money. You have this IOU for, let's say, $100. 
Now you're waiting after the war and you're waiting for the government to pay you this money back. And as each month goes on, as each year goes on, uh, you're becoming more concerned or more, you're betting that that money is not going to be paid back. So a speculator, and we'll make the speculator wear a fancy top hat and uh, a monocle. Um, I guess that's a monocle and a cane. A speculator comes up and says, look, you're probably never going to see this money. The government's never going to pay you back. So I'll buy this IOU from, uh, I'll buy this IOU off of you for, let's say, $10, right? And in this case, a lot of the veterans, a lot of the people who were uh, holding these IOUs said, okay, I'll take the $10. And this IOU then ended up in the hands of speculators. And so Hamilton, by paying back the debt, was ultimately giving money not to uh, the people who still, well, he was giving money to the people who held or still held the IOUs, but many of these things had gone on to uh, speculators, and many people like James Madison thought that it was unfair uh, to pay those back. So that ultimately um, led to you know intense debate about that particular issue. You know, was this actually ending up in the hands of people who uh, who deserved it? Um, another big debate was about combining all the debts, particularly among the states. So for example, there were some states that owed a lot of money. There were some states that owed little money. And um, you know, by combining all these debts together, essentially they were punishing the states that had paid back their debts and rewarding the states that had very big debts because now they weren't responsible for it. Ultimately, this debate was between Hamilton and Jefferson on a fundamental level. Ultimately, there was an agreement the debts were combined. Uh, Hamilton did get his economic program. And in return, what the uh, opponents of Hamilton got was a new location for the nation's capital. So we might say of the nation's capital, a new location in the South. This would become, of course, today where Washington, D.C. is. And the idea behind creating the nation's capital in the South, as opposed to New York City, which was actually where the first Congress uh, met, um, was that New York was considered to be like the financial district, right? That Congress and Wall Street were literally right next door to each other. And what opponents of Hamilton wanted to do was to move the nation's capital outside of the center of um, you know economic interests, banking interests, business interests. Uh, and so uh, the nation's capital was, you know, after that uh, agreed upon to be in D.C. and it was built there. And that's where government would be housed once the construction was complete. So, um, you know, the issue of debts was being addressed. The second report that Hamilton created, the report on the National Bank, the National Bank was something that England had. It was a way for a nation to really manage its finances. Uh, the National Bank could loan money to American merchants. It could store money and invest it. It can make the, the nation grow economically. More or less, we can just summarize a National Bank as being a way for the federal government uh, to be more, say, financially active, right? We'll just say more financially active. Uh, and this was also a way for the National Bank to discipline the state banks or the local banks, uh, kind of overpower them in a certain sense. Uh, Jefferson, for example, believed the National Bank was too powerful and, uh, you know, objected to it. But ultimately, Hamilton got his wishes from President Washington. Um, you know, once Washington put the seal of approval on something, it was very hard to oppose it, and a new national bank was created. Lastly, the last thing that Hamilton reported on was manufacturers. You can think of manufacturers as being production. Uh, this also included ways to raise revenues. So for example, Alexander Hamilton put into effect a tax on whiskey, again, raise a way to raise money. Uh, additionally, protective tariffs were issued. Like we said before, tariffs were used to raise money, but it could also um, help American businesses, right? So a protective tariff is a tax that not only raised money, it's a tax on imports, but really the design, say designed to you know protect, it's right there in the word, 
uh, we'll just say promote US industry. All right, so for example, if we got England and we got the US, right? And uh, they're making iron, say iron. And uh, let's just assume that the quality of iron is the same. However, the US iron costs $2 and English iron costs only $1. Um, in this circumstance, most people would buy the iron from England, same quality, it's cheaper, but one way that the United States can help foster its own domestic industry is by placing a tariff, right? And so if the tariff or tax is two more dollars, that brings the overall cost of English iron to three, of American iron to two, and that means most people are gonna buy now stuff from the US. And that's good for the American economy because when American businesses do good, they can grow, they can hire more people, unemployment goes down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So not only did it raise money in a sense that you could collect this $2 and you know store it for the national government, it was a way to promote or protect, right? Protective tariffs, um, US industries, Hamilton also wanted subsidies. This was kind of economic, we'll just call this economic aid, aid slash maybe incentives for US business, All right? So, you know, think of Hamilton and the Federalists as being very business centered, very banking centered. Uh, very much wanting to emulate and copy England, you know, turn the United States into an industrial, financial, trading, uh, kind of urban in some ways, um, power in much the same way that the powers of, uh, of Europe were. Uh, like we mentioned before, not everyone agreed. So uh, before we jump ahead, Hamilton did get all of his economic plan, right? So Hamilton did get all of his economic plan. So uh, all the debts were combined together. Uh, bonds were issued under Hamilton. Uh, you know, the deal that was made, uh, a new nation's capital was created. That wasn't really Hamilton's uh, idea, but, um, you know, that's what uh, sort of what compromise came out of that. A new national bank was created, the first national bank, as we call it. A tax on whiskey was created, protective tariffs were created, and subsidies were given to American businesses. And... For the most part, we can, uh, you know, somewhat, um, you know, we could say without controversy that, uh, you know, the underlying issue of the economy got better, right? The economy got better. That for all practical purposes, we can say that Alexander Hamilton's economic plan kind of, you know, got the United States out of the rut of the um you know of the 1780s and the 1790s however there does come a lot of opposition namely james madison and thomas jefferson of virginia um james madison and jefferson feel like much of hamilton's economic plan is too much centralized power Um, you know, they really believe that Hamilton is favoring the bankers and elite businessmen at the expense of the ordinary citizen. Uh, in Thomas Jefferson's eyes, Hamilton's trying to create a country that is really antithetical to uh, a democratic republic. Instead, an emphasis should be made on the United States being a rural nation. Jefferson's vision of the yeoman farmer, a yeoman farmer is an independent land-owning farmer. And the idea is, is that, you know, in order for a democratic republic to survive, in which people, you know, one person has one vote, uh, people need to not rely on corrupt institutions like businesses and banks. And it's only when you own your own land that you're truly independent in that sense. And so instead, the United, United States ought to be an agrarian nation. It shouldn't copy Europe and become an urban manufacturing nation. Uh, of course, in the long run, Thomas Jefferson was wrong about this, um, but this was what he believed. And pretty soon, those who opposed 
the Federalists began, you know, publishing newspapers to counter the Federalist uh, position. Uh, newspapers were really where ideas, we'll say between the first party system uh, were published. You know, it was sort of a way of uh, kind of bickering or debating back and forth. There were certain newspapers that were Federalist uh, positioned and certain newspapers that were you know, in favor of the Democratic Republican. One critique of Washington and Hamilton was this right here, rules for changing a republic uh, into a monarchy. Again, this idea of monarchy hearkening back to this notion of too much centralized power, right? That Hamilton and uh, Washington were trying to do that. Uh, like we mentioned before, the Democratic Republicans come to create their own political party. They tend to be more rural. They tend to be more of the farmers. Uh, we might call them the non-elites, whereas the, you know, the elites tend to uh, favor the Federalist Party. Uh, and artisans. Artisans is a good term to be familiar with. Uh, an artisan is simply a person who, let's say a person who makes things. So these might be people who live in cities. Um, but are skilled workers, right? So they might be like a blacksmith or a, a shoemaker, a, a barrel maker, you know, whatever it may be. So artisans, you, you're much more likely to find artisans in cities. Again, they're, they're not really amongst the elite classes, but they might vote for the Democratic Republican uh, Party. So that kind of gives you an idea of some of these early debates, you know, in the nation between Jefferson and his followers and Hamilton and his followers. One last thing uh, that the first Congress did, kind of important in shaping uh, the early United States, was how the United States defined citizenship. We'd mentioned this previously uh, in a past chapter, but the 1790 Naturalization Act, this was um, a law passed which defined Uh, U.S. citizenship. And in that language was free white persons. And that was essentially defining the United States as a white republic. And this would very much be the case really all the way up until some of the abolitionists begin to challenge this notion of what it means to be an American citizen. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, however, though, on the state level, recall that when it came to states and voting rights, that it was not just white and male, but it was also some sort of financial requirement, either property ownership or uh, paying taxes, something along those lines. One sort of interesting uh, note here is New Jersey. The reason why New Jersey is interesting is that because between the years 1776 and 1807, unmarried women voted. Uh, this was the only state in which that occurred in 1807 that would change back. Um, and then, you know, in the mid 1800s, you begin to see the formation of a women's suffrage movement, which goes on all the way into the 1920s before federal women's suffrage is uh, achieved.